Hi, how are you today? This is Pastor Bob Barker from Crossroads Community Church inviting you to come and spend a special service with us this Easter. And we have a great thing planned for you. We want you to come and join us right here at Theater 3, 2800 Ruth Street in Uptown Dallas. God bless you and we'll see you Easter Sunday morning. of things that we want to share with you and today's message is just one of them I want to invite you to come and participate in our services here join us here every Sunday morning at 930 for our Bible study we have different speakers that come and you I think you'll enjoy them matter of fact today's message is also one of those I have a special message for you each and every Sunday morning at 1030 right here at Crossroads which meets at Theater 3 2800 Ruth Street and Hal right here in Uptown Dallas so if you have this Sunday off Come and visit with us, and let's go to the service right now. Amen, amen, amen. Well, take a seat just for a moment. You know, we are going to do something different the month of April, and some of you are aware of it, some of you are not so aware of it. Uh, we are on the Sunday, the April the 27th, we are going to be giving away a brand new, out-of-the-box, new iPad Air 7. That's the latest version of the iPad. It's the full one, not the mini. And uh, here's how it's going to go. Every Sunday that you're here, you're going to get a little slip to sign up. Every Sunday that you're here, you're going to put that little slip in the offering. And every Sunday that you bring someone, you get a slip for yourself and a slip for them, and they get one. If you're at Sunday school with Haley, you're going to get another one. So there's lots of opportunities to put your name in this to win this brand new iPad. So it is up to you how many chances you put in the box. They're all up to you. So who did not get one already? I know the two of you didn't get one. I know Robert didn't get one. So come down and get one. All the rest of us can't get, get a chance for it. But here's the deal. Sign that. Put it very clear, all your information. I want, this is a good way for me to kind of make sure that all the records are up to date and everybody's phone numbers and email addresses are all good. Uh, and uh, I, Neil, I don't, do you have an email? Can I get it? Okay. Here's the deal. Easter is two weeks away. Can you believe that? Uh, so be sure to bring some folks with you on Easter they'll have a chance to win as well. You know, what? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be wonderful if you brought somebody to church and they won it? Here's the deal. You have to be here on the 27th to win. You must be present to win because it is on that little thing. There is no question about it. I've got a great message for Easter, and I've got one, a great one to follow up with. So it'll be, it'll be really very good. I, I know that your guests will uh, appreciate it. We've got two wonderful ladies with us today, Jesse and Kai are with us today and make sure that you meet them and welcome them and make sure that they feel welcomed here. Uh, open your Bibles, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. It's interesting how the Lord moves. And uh, I think it's very interesting that how this, the, this, the worship went this morning because it couldn't fit better into the message that the Lord has me bringing this morning. Here in Deuteronomy 8, and I'm reading from the King James just for a moment, and it says, And you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. We all think that we've got good talents, we've got great skills, we went to school. But you know what? We have nothing to do with what we have. He is the giver, the author of everything. The next verse says, but you will remember the Lord your God, for it is he that has given you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore unto thy fathers as it is this day. The covenant that he wants us to share with our folks, especially in the LGBT community, is the fact that God loves them just the way they are. They don't have to change any more than a person of color would have to change to be white, or we would have to change to be black or brown or green or purple or polka dotted. God does not ask us to change to come to him. He just wants us to be his kids. 
And, uh, you know, I think that it's wonderful. I've got four wonderful daughters, and every one of them are different. And it's hard to believe that out of the same two people, you can get such a wide variety of people. I'm sure you think that sometimes too, Robert. You know, where did they come up with that? You know, we don't know where they got that, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing. So this morning, I want to remind you that your job is not because of anything you've done. That's what I was praying over Marvin a while ago. God has him where he is, not for Marvin, but for the people around Marvin. We're there to bring the presence of God into their lives. We're there to bring the presence of God into that business. And we're also there to bring the blessings of God on that business. And sometimes we don't understand why we have changes and all that, but God knows what that's doing. You know, it's all good. Keith leaves. And Marvin moves, not in the same spot, but back to, into America. Uh, so I want us to take a moment, and I want us to pray, and I want us to thank the Lord, you know what? That he is in charge of everything. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning that we can come boldly before the throne, not, not striking out of fear that what you might do to us, but Father, knowing that you have your arms outstretched us, if we will just come to you, you will pour out your love and blessings upon us. So, Father, we pray today for our community and beyond that, Father, they will truly experience your presence in their lives and how much you love them. So, Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and the glory now as we bring you our tithes and offerings, and we worship you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. If you're making out a check this morning, make it out to Crossroads. If you're putting... Cash in the offering, please put it in the offering envelope so we can give you proper tax credit at the end of the year. And uh, Joel was in the hospital this week, and I was glad I got to pray for him this morning. Uh, Joel, is there anything you want to share about this week, or do you want to wait? Echocardiogram, EKG. Amen. The what ifs. Right. Top of your head to the soles of your feet, you're healed. So uh, that's good news. I want to I want to tell you a story about last week. He was I, I thought that Dr. Paul would have been here this morning. Uh, last week, you know, I talked on on stress, and that really wasn't the message that I had planned on bringing, to tell you the truth. But I mean, the Spirit of the Lord really kind of spoke to me the day before, which was you know I I pray start praying on Sunday for next Sunday's message, and and it was real interesting that God had that kind of change up. Often like Sunday school, you know, you get there thinking you have one idea and then God moves it around and changes it all. Uh, Dr. Paul, for the last 10 years, I don't know, I, I, I'm sure it's at least 10, uh, he, he's, he's been a dentist for a whole lot more than that. Sean, you're dropping things, baby. Uh, he's been a dentist for a lot longer than that, but for the last 10 years, he has been treating underprivileged children through Medicaid, through the state's Medicaid program. And... He got notice just a few weeks ago that they have decided that over the last 10 years, they have overpaid all of these dentists in the state of Texas that have provided care for these kids who are on Medicare, and they are suing all of the individual doctors for all of that, and his balance would be two and a half million dollars he's been paid. So, uh, he said that that message on stress <laughs> couldn't have come at a better time for him. Uh, this week he, uh, I think it was either Thursday or Friday because he kept texting me, we kept texting back and forth. Uh, he had a meeting with the judge at 11 o'clock and then the following day, I never did hear about what happened, transpired that day, but uh, he texted and he said it's all very interesting. He said that two of the 
Two of the dentists have already won their case against that. And I told him, I said, you know, that would be like me getting on an American airline plane, having paid a ticket fare, and get to the end and say I couldn't get off until I paid more. I just, I can't, I can't believe that for 10 years you decide, oh, we paid you too much. You know, maybe six months. 10 years to me, that's like berserk. So remember him, I'm sure that there's still some, you know, uh, situations about that 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 I'm sure he's gonna be dealing with and hopefully it's concluded, but uh, all that to say, uh, he was very thankful about that. And I got a couple of other notes about people who had been uh, in stressful situations that the word really ministered to them last week as well. So I want us to take a moment. I want you to join hands with someone next to you. And I have a reason for that. So just join hands with someone next to you. And I want us to pray this morning before we get into the word. Father, I pray for the person on our right hand right now. Father, I pray that, that their, their being, their whole being, body, soul, and spirit are well with you right now. That, Father, it's through that touch right now that, that you are ministering to every person here. Father, I pray for that person on our left hand. Father, I pray that every need that they have is already met by your riches in Christ Jesus in glory. Right now, Father, I thank you that every need that we have is already met. Father, the little things that we, that we worry about, Father, I thank you that you're dismissing all of that worry right now because you care for us. So, Father, we worship you today and we bless you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Social scientists, and I've got some information I want to read you, have shown in many studies over the year that support touch, supportive touch, can have good outcomes in a number of different realms. Considering the following examples, if you would. A teacher touches a student on the back or on the arm, that student is more likely to participate in class. The more athletes high five and hug their teammates, the better their game will be. A touch can make patients like their doctors more. If, you're touch, if you touch a bus driver, he's more likely to let you on for free. If a waitress touches the arm or a shoulder of a customer, she may get a larger tip. But why does a friendly or supportive touch have such a universal and positive effect? What happens in our brains and bodies that account for this magic? To understand this, we need to start on the outside with the skin. It's our largest or organ covering about 20 square feet. That's about the size of a small twin mattress. If somebody touches you, there's a pressure pushing on your skin at the point of contact and just under the skin are pressure receptors called pasininin corpuscles, says Tiffany Field, who's one of the leading uh, re touch researchers. And she's in charge of the Touch Institute at the University of Miami in Florida. They receive pressure stimulation Field says, and the pressure receptors send a signal to the brain. The Passanini corpuscle signals go directly to the important nerve bundle deep in the brain called the vagus nerve. The vagus sometimes is called the wanderer because it has branches that wanders throughout our body to several internal organs, including the heart. And it's the vagus nerve that slows, when the, slows down the heart and decreases the blood pressure when our bodies are touched. Field describes studies in which subjects were asked to perform something stressful like public speaking or taking a timed math test. The subject's partners were also a part of the experiment, hugging or holding hands with the subject when the researchers told them to. They found that in fact people who were given this as a stressful task, they were, if they had been holding hands or been hugged, they would have had lower blood pressure and a lower heart rate, suggesting that they were less stressed. Holding hands or hugging also results in a decrease of stress hormone. Uh, Matt Hertenstein calls, and he's the experimental psychologist at DuPaul uh, University. Having this friendly touch, just someone simply touching our arm or holding it buffers the psychological consequences of stressful response. In addition to calming us down and reducing our stressful response, a friendly touch also increases 
the, oxy, let's see, oxytocin, also called the cuddle hormone, which affects our behaviors. Am I, am I saying it right? Oxytocin. Oxytocin levels go up with holding hands, hugging, especially with massage. The cuddle hormone makes us feel closer to one another. It really lays the biological foundation and structure for connecting to other people. Besides uh, uh, engendering feelings of closeness, being touched is also pleasant. We also, let's see, we usually want more. <laughs> yeah, we do. When you say that, when you're being touched, you just want more? So what's going on in the brain that accounts for these feelings? He has said in recent studies from England, pinpointed in the area of the brain that becomes highly activated in response to friendly touch. It's the region, region also called the orbital frontal cortex, uh, located just above your eyes. It's in the same area that responds to sweet taste and pleasant smells. A soft touch on the arm makes the orbital frontal cortex light up, just like those rewarding stimuli. So touch is a very powerful rewarding stimuli, just like your chocolate that you find in the cupboard at home. The surging of oxytocin makes you feel more trusting and connected. And the cascade of electrical impulses slows your heart, lowers your blood pressure, makes you feel less stressed and more soothed. Remarkably, this complex surge of events in the brain and body are initiated by a simple supportive touch. So today, I want us to take a look at all the things that Jesus did while he was here when he touched people. I think it's really important, you know, that we have so much trouble when uh, we may feel all tied up with bureaucracy and the fact that we can't uh, get out of things, and that's a stressful situation. We have others that, you know, people that are confined, that, have, that are in prison, uh, they feel like their whole, their whole world is lost. We have people that are working with students and kids and doctors and their patients and they're seeming like there's this disconnect between them. We live in such a hurried world, you know? And I think it's important that when we realize that we have the ability to stop and to turn that around just by a simple touch, just by stopping, <clears throat> I think it's important for us to realize that we have in our hand the grasp of something. Conflict comes. We see students and teachers that just can't, can't work it out. You see people like that yelling at a student that was captured. Why don't we have any better understanding that if we'll just touch in an appropriate way between moms and kids, consumers and vendors, I thought this was pretty good. 82% of respondents have stopped doing business with an organization due to poor customer experience or the poor lack of understanding between that and their customer. If we had an understanding of the power that we have when we walk in and amongst other people and we touch them in the name of Jesus, then we don't even have to say that. We can make a huge difference. You know, even in tenants and landlords, I was talking to one of the guys that was at a, uh, a dinner last night, and it was real interesting to see that even people who are aggravated when they're touched, it'll make a change in them. One of the studies that I looked at was interesting. It was done by at and It was years ago when they had real phones that took money. Remember the old coin-operated phones? What they did was they had a bank of phones, and they left coins in them in a couple of them. And you know how people used to do to go by and swing through there and pull all those out. Well, they had somebody that left some change. It came in, somebody else was on the phone next to them, and they left the money in the phone. They came back and said, did, did you see anybody get the money out of this phone? No, the person did take it in, and they said no. They did that time after time after time after time. Human nature, no, no, no. Then they had the person come back and put their hand, did you see anybody put, take the money that was out of here? Every time that they put their hand on their shoulder, the person responded with the truth. Every time they didn't, the person didn't respond with the truth. Because there is a connection that we make with someone else in that moment 
of touch. So I want us to take a look at some scriptures here this morning. We live in this Zoom world, and I think it's interesting. We can be in our living rooms, and we can see war all the way around on the other side. We can see that, and we can understand that that's going on, and it, it means nothing to us. But you know what? There's a lot of war going on in people's lives that if we would take a look just for a moment and sit down and say, can I pray with you? Can I take your hand? Can I pray with you? Can I just take a moment? You know what? I live in a very busy world. I am crushed for time. I told Doug, he called me yesterday, and he said, are you coming? Are you coming? Are you coming? I said, oh, I wanted to tell him no. I really did. I wanted to tell him no because I got in late Friday night from Pittsburgh, only had yesterday, and I have to leave right after church to go to Philadelphia. And I'm sitting there going, I don't really have the time to go, but I need to go. I need to go. I need to go. I was glad I went when I got there because I had a really good time. We all live in a busy world. I promise you, we all have our little day timers and our phones just jam packed with stuff going on during the day. We all have busy lives. But you know what? I was glad I went. The food was great, the fellowship was fun. I got to meet other new people that I had not met. When you take the time to pray with somebody, to just spend a moment with them. You may not feel like you've got the time. You may not feel like you've got the energy. You may not feel like they even want that. But if you will take that moment, you'll be glad you did. You'll be glad that you decided, you know what? I'm important, but you know what? They're really more important. They're really more important. And taking that moment, taking their hand, taking their shoulder, I promise you, it will be a good thing. What I want us to do, take a look in your Bible. I'm going to have these up here on, on the top. This, you might think, is a far, far away place. But it's really not. It's a fingerprint. That means more to some people, just a touch than a whole lot of things. So I want, us to, I want you to think about that touch all day today. Every person that you come into contact with, I want you to think about that. In Matthew 8, 1 through 3, it says, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. You know what? Everybody followed Jesus. When he was there, when he spoke, herds of people, throngs of people, oftentimes pushing him into the sea oftentimes pushing him to a place where he had been up all night, two or three days, taking care of the needs of people. And you know what? He never said no. He never said no. So here comes this guy, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, isn't that really what it's all about? If we're willing to do something? It's not if we can. He didn't ask if you could do this for me. He didn't ask, can you do this for me? He said, if you're willing to do this for me. He said, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleaned of his leprosy. Are we willing to do what God asks us to do? Are we willing to extend our hand to people when we know they've got a problem? Are we willing to take just a moment out of our busy day and say, you know what? The Lord just spoke to me and I need to pray with you. Would you mind if I prayed with you right now? I guarantee you, they'll think differently of you. Jesus and the, I call them the boys, <laughs> the disciples, uh, went to Peter's mother-in-law house, and that means that he was obviously married at some point in time. And uh, the mother-in-law was fixing dinner for everyone, and the problem with it was she got sick while she was fixing dinner. And I don't know if it was the food that she was cooking, that they were hungry, that they went and did this or not, but whatever the reason was, Jesus went and touched her hand, and the fever left her immediately, and she got up and began to serve them and take care of them. I don't care how insignificant it may be. A headache, if you've got it, is a big deal. <clears throat> If somebody else has got it, well, why don't you just take an Advil and go on? You know what? It's so easy just to say, 
Would you mind if I just take a moment and pray with you? Can I just put my hand on your head and just pray for your headache? You know, just rebuke the devil and he'll leave. We know this story. This is the story about Jesus, and I, I call her the little Baptist lady. Remember the little Baptist lady? She had been uh, ill with an issue of blood for 12 years, and she had been hiding out because she couldn't be found in public because she was bleeding. And so she finally has spent all the money that she has had, and she has suffered, the Bible says, of many physicians, and no, nothing had helped her. And so what happened was, she was on her way, and there's a problem because this, this scenario comes into play. Jairus, who is the leader of the synagogue, his daughter is ill, and he is also headed towards Jesus. There's a big crowd of people, the throngs around him again. And the story, the part that I like about it is the fact is that she's going up towards Jesus, and there with him is Jairus, the overseer of the synagogue, which could have put her to death on sight, could have had her stoned. She is there realizing that I'm going to have to step in the path of death to get what I want, which is just to touch the hem of his garment. You'll remember that story. But here we have the fact that Jairus has come and said, would you please come and lay hands on my daughter? She's just died but come and put your hand on her and she will live. He was setting that scenario up. He, with his words, said, if you will do this, my daughter will live. She had said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I will be whole. So here we have people who have put their faith in works and we're waiting to see how it plays out. After the crowd had been put aside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. Well, what happened in the meantime was... This woman has come in and pressed up through the people and touched the hem of his garment and slipped back out very quickly. The Bible said that she was immediately healed. Immediately. Not days later, weeks later. No. Immediately healed. And I think it's very interesting. That touch was a touch of faith. Because everybody, you know, he turned around and said, who touched me? <laughs> the disciples said, Take a look. Any of these people could have touched you. He said, no, 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 no. Somebody touched me with their faith. And the crowd stepped away, and here's this woman standing by herself. And he told her, your faith has made you whole. It was a touch, a simple touch. And again, a simple touch, a simple touch. And she got up. She was well. He had set that up. The very interesting part about it is, while all the commotion is going on with the woman, a runner comes up to Jairus and says, oh, listen, don't bother the master. The little girl's already dead. Our circumstances are not our problem. God wants to touch every circumstance in our life, no matter how how drastic and dire it may be. We've got to understand, he will go to great lengths to do what he wants to do for us. All he wants to do is to put us in a position to receive our healing, whatever it is. Let's take a look here. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his, edge of his cloak. And he said to herself, if I just touch his cloak, I will be healed. Just touch just touch. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. You know, sometimes we just need to make sure that we set it up. You know, God, I am reaching out to you. You know, I went to ORU and uh, Oral Roberts University in Tulsa. And I'll tell you, Oral got a lot of flack. I mean, a lot of flack from having people reach to the television while he prayed. It wasn't the television. It was that stretching forth and agreeing with him in faith. Your faith has to have an action. You can talk about your faith until everybody is blue and dead, but if you don't have some 
works to follow it up with, there's nothing going to happen. These people had touched him and spoken their faith, and they got the results that they were looking for. I love this story. And Jesus went from there. Two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on a son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and asked him, Do you believe, he said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yeah. And yes, Lord, they replied. And he touched their eyes and said, According to your what? According to your faith be it done to you. There are a lot of things in my life that I want really bad. And I have put them all on that table. And I pray over them every single day, every morning when I get up and every night before I go to bed. And I'm seeing some of those happen. I'm seeing some of them happen like it's late at night, you're in a dark room and someone opens the door and you just see a little crack of light. It's not enough to spill into the room yet, but you know it's going to open and the room is going to be illuminated all the way. I see that happening. I see it happening. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding people country. People brought all their sick to them. How many? How many? You know what? If we knew that Jesus was coming to the American Airlines arena or bigger to the Cowboy Stadium, if we knew that, if we knew that he was going to be there, wouldn't we go and empty every hospital we could empty? every convalescent home, we would do that. People brought everyone they knew that was sick because they had heard that he was coming and everywhere he went, people got healed and maybe Aunt Mary will finally get it. So they drug Aunt Mary down to the place and begged him to let the sick touch the edge of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. All he did was just walk in and amongst them. Their faith reached out and touched. Those people that didn't, didn't get it. Remember the story about the little guy with the withered hand? Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. If he hadn't done that, I don't believe he would have been healed. Because it takes some action on our part to get God to see that we're moving with him. I am actually going to agree with God. I am not going to let my mind get control of the situation. I am looking beyond what I can see. I'm expecting God to do it. And you know what? That expectation and you moving in and pressing in with God, he says, I'm going to meet you. I'm going to meet you. Problem is, we don't have enough people wanting to meet him. You know, I think it's interesting. Moses didn't get to go into the promised land because he hit the rock. Remember that? He took the stick and he hit the rock. I would have hit the people. Forty years of murmuring, gossiping, backbiting, bunch of Jews, didn't want to be there. I mean, I would have hit them. But instead he hit the rock. And because that rock represented Jesus, he didn't get to go in. But you know what? He didn't have to go in with all those murmuring, backbiting, gossiping Jews because he goes in with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. If you'll remember the story. Who else is there with him? Anybody remember? Elijah's there. So here's the story. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led him up high in the mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could have bleached them. So what happens? When the disciples heard this, they fell, down, they fell face down to the ground. They were horrified. How many of you have ever been just terrified? How many of you have ever wanted something so bad that you just could taste it? You just wanted it so bad. They were fearful. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. One more. 
And when the disciples heard this, they said, oh, that's, I'm sorry. Our God is a caring God. How many would agree with that? He cared so much, he could have spoken to that dirt to become man. He could have spoken to that dirt. It would have done it. He spoke everything else into existence, but no, what did he do? He took his hands and he formed us. How much love and how much care did he take that he didn't have to to imprint us with something that was so important to him, that touch, so important to him. He gave us access to himself through his intimate presence within our lives. He wants to be with us. He wants to penetrate us, to be on the inside. He wants permission to live inside us. You know, he's a perfect gentleman. He'll never force his way in on anyone's life. But he wants access to us. And finally, he cares with no limitation. No one is abandoned. No one. Our community has been taught over and over and over that God doesn't love them, that they are out there on their own and they're going to hell in a handbasket. And you know what? They believe it. That's where we come in. We have to take a moment long enough to tell them, you know what? God loves you just the way you are. No one's abandoned. No one's rejected ever, ever, ever. But we need to reach out to them. We need to do more than we're doing. Our community needs to have a touch from us. We know too much to sit down and not do something. So this morning, I want us to remind us the fact that, you know what? He has given us the answers to our community. We need to show them who he is. We need to show them how much concern and care he has for them because we need to be him to them. We need to touch their lives. We need to be the people that are out there saying, you know what, God loves you just the way you are. Don't be so afraid of who he is. He's not out there with a big stick trying to beat you up. He's out there with his arms wide open. This morning, we get to remember all of that because we have communion this morning. And I want you to realize all of the things that Jesus did for us when he died for us. If you've got sickness in your body this morning, his body was broken so yours doesn't have to be. If you feel like you just are sick from the inside out, he said, take this cup. This is the New Testament. And he said, you know what? That is all of the wholeness that I need on the inside of me. I'm reminding myself that his body was broken, that he spilt his blood for me. If he hadn't done it for anybody else, he would have done it. Hi, how are you today? This is Pastor Bob Barker from Crossroads Community Church inviting you to come and spend a special service with us this Easter, and we have a great thing planned for you. We want you to come and join us right here at Theater 3, 2800 Ruth Street in Uptown Dallas. God bless you, and we'll see you Easter Sunday morning.